Mr. Minister, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Master of Ceremony, for all these beautiful words you said about me. There's only one point I'd like to take issue with you. When you said that I come from a small country in the middle of the Indian Ocean, because I've always taken the view myself that no country is small if it is surrounded by the sea. Mr. Chairman, my talk is going to revolve mostly towards the situation on the continent of Africa. Now in December, the end of December, Last year, the United Press International, in association with the Peace Federation, came forward with a magazine, published a magazine entitled Dialogue and Alliance. And its focus was peace building in Africa. Many people contributed in this magazine, including uh, Ben King Moon, Secretary General of the United Nations, my good friend, Honorable Riley Odinga, who happens to be Prime Minister of Kenya, and many other personalities. My own articles, my own article was entitled Among My African Friends. I believe it's pertinent okay. that I should cite a few points which I made in this article in terms of how I saw the development of the African continent. Can Africa claim the 21st century? was the title of a book published by the World Bank just at the close of the century. And there, in my article, I said that Africa can become and claim to the 21st century that there was a proviso. This proviso is that major changes are made in several strategic areas, foremost among them being improvement in governance, the resolution of conflicts, investment in people, in diversifying the economies, and increasing competitiveness, reducing aid dependence, debts, and strengthening partnership. Too many leaders thought that state intervention was a shortcut to prosperity. This is after the nation became independent. Many spent precious time demolishing old statues, changing names of streets, towns and cities, and debating which tribal language to introduce, to replace or compete with English, French, or Portuguese. Too many failed to realize that under certain circumstances, continuity with the past could constitute the secret of growth. Many experimented with socialism. In the wake of the military overthrow of the Convention People's Government in Ghana, when fast cars mansions and golden beds were traced to government and party functionaries, it began to dawn to ideologues that socialism and wealth accumulation were not, after all, strange bedfellows. 
Some made it their priority to interfere with the politically neutral services that they inherited by introducing party loyalty as criteria for selecting and promoting staff, cronism, and incalculable damage to morals, discipline, and professionalism. In the civil service of several African nations, I have great hopes for Africa and for people. I fully share the views of Thompson Ayodele, who is a great friend, Jamaican, who said, some people say that Africa needs a new Marshall Plan of massive aid to drag it out of poverty and set it on the road to prosperity and self-sufficiency. Yet they seem unaware that in the past 50 years, Africa has received the equivalent of five Marshall Plans in foreign aid. Ladies and gentlemen, last year, when Air Seychelles started the first flight from Seychelles to Cape Town, I was privileged to be invited to join this flight. And when some friends in South Africa heard I was coming to Cape Town, they said, would I agree to go and pay a visit to Zimbabwe, to Harare. I had not been to Harare before, although I followed the cultural development when Harare, when Zimbabwe was southern Rhodesia. From the time when Jan Smith declared unilateral independence to the day when President Mugabe took control of the nation. I was, of course, very interested as a man committed to try and search for peace, to try and unite nations through the process of reconciliation, to go and see for myself what Zimbabwe was all about and whether all these measures the West were taking to bring down Mugabe was justified. I arrived in Harare and saw what a beautiful country. Harare is a beautiful city. Those people who invited me, in fact, were on the list of business people whose assets had been frozen in Europe because they were alleged to have had very close collaboration with President Mugabe. So there was the West trying to respond to the need of changes in Zimbabwe by making it difficult for the West to continue trading with Zimbabwe. But when I got on the ground, I saw a picture which started to disturb me. As I walked along the streets, the only business people I saw were from China. Now, the Chinese had no colonial baggage, and the Chinese policy is trading. They say we're not too much interested in internal contention problems. What we want is contract. We want to be able to access mineral resources, natural resources, etc. So what did I see was that the people of Zimbabwe were the ones suffering as a result of the sanctions imposed by the West. It is true that perhaps the majority of the people of Zimbabwe are against the regime in power now. However, being against is one thing, but Bringing down the government is a different question altogether, especially when you have created an army 
when politics is characterized by tribalism, etc. So there I saw, and in a matter of a few months after China signed contracts with Mugabe's government, the dollar had been introduced as a currency in Zimbabwe. I remember reading a few months before when a beggar in the street of Harare was supposed to have collected six million of their currency in four hours of begging. But this six million of the currency at that time had the equivalent value of less than perhaps one American dollar. So these people decided that they were going to take me from Harare way up across Zimbabwe to Thompson Fall, Victoria Fall, great natural wonders of the world. And as we flew in this private plane down to this area, one could see these undulating plains, the wealth, this vast nation, this beautiful country, sparsely populated, but full of wealth, being neglected because there was lack of investment, because there was so much political turmoil. This is a land of wildlife, great country of tourism. This is a country Britain chose to induce their own people to go and settle at a time when they had a lot of choices being the master of a vast empire. So there in Thompson Fall, I was to witness one of the beginning of the effects of perhaps sanction. My host took me to Victoria Lake, great waterfall, great river, full of hippopotamus. Already quite a lot of tourists from different parts of the world were there. But the boat taking us there were third rate. Sometimes you felt that maybe it'll go down as you stood on one side to watch an hippo coming up to breathe. Now that night, I was uh, accommodated in um, one of the so-called five-star hotels. Now when I got to the hotel, welcomed by the management, the first thing he told me, he said, by the way, we've got to apologize, but we don't have running water tonight. So this is a land you just left a waterfall where there's so much water. But we put some water in your bath and maybe you could, you know, clean yourself for dinner. I did. And later on, I retired. At 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, I woke up. My apartment, I was put in a little villa, right on a little mountain top, surrounded by wildlife, roaring animals. At two o'clock I discovered there was no power. I was in the dark. I wanted to move out of this bed. I couldn't see how I could do it without getting down on the ground. And at any rate, the point is, because of all this problem, a great potential, the potential of tourism is affecting this great country. Africa, yes, can claim, provided certain steps are taken against the background of new leadership prepared to meet the challenges of the future, like Singapore met its own challenges. One thing Singaporeans were educated in 
was to know, and they know where their bread and butter come from. They are intelligent people, and they are guided by wisdom and knowledge in the pursuit of policy which has made their country so well known and so famous. Now, Africa, the age has come, but there are several areas which must be tackled. First, the area of good governance. You know, we speak about dictators for life. This situation arose with the encouragement of many big powers during the time when many nations were becoming independent. We had, as you know, what was known as the Cold War. Now, if you became independent and you were pro-West, you were encouraged by the West to stay put because your alternative in opposition was normally a communist or a socialist. So against this background, we saw a lot of leaders suddenly assuming the position of being present for life and behaving as if the country belonged to them. And in many instances, this was done with the encouragement of the Western powers. Or vice versa, if you were a secretary in Guinea, your friends in Moscow or China would also want you to sit food. It's only after the Cold War that we saw a lot of pressure being bare. We brought to bear on people like Mobutu Seko, who had been a long-time friend of the West to try and change and bring about better governance in his nation. We speak about corruption. But believe you me that behind every corrupted African leader, you normally had two or three corrupted American businessmen or three or four corrupted European businessmen. There is an area which must be faced squarely if Africa is going to find what is necessary to develop its social infrastructures and to meet its human resources requirements. Africa must aim to have as little a defense budget as possible. When you take into account the amount of money which is being spent on military warfare. Now, those of us who've been following all this turmoil in the Middle East, in Libya, are we not surprised in seeing all these amount of tanks, artilleries, ammunition, which suddenly is emerging, and we are looking at it. That was not to prepare for war. And now we know it's being utilized to suppress the people itself. I believe any nation who is a friend of Africa should subscribe to a philosophy aiming at saying no to the sale of sophisticated artillery, all these big weapons which absorb so much of money needed for social human resource development. In this very hall, I think last year, we were being addressed by the former Minister of Defense of the Netherlands, who took over the position of Deputy Chief of NATO. And you know what he admitted? That the collective world budget for defense purposes is 40 times more than what the world is spending on human resource development projects. 
How many schools, how many hospitals, how many reservoirs we could build? 40 times more is being spent on military equipment. So that every day today when there's a revolution, instead of people fighting with bows and arrows and stone and stick, they are equipped with powerful weapons. So when instead of that are killed, we got a thousand, five thousand, etc. So I do believe this is an area which must be addressed. If we sincerely believe in bringing about a better world order. Leadership must come from the top visions. Unfortunately, over the last years, during the time of the founding father of the United States, the credo was, right is might. And so many of us were educated in that philosophy. But unfortunately, today, the reverse is the case. Might is right. And that's the philosophy of Gaddafi. I've got the power now, and I'm going to crush you. But this is a philosophy which we must study and adopt and find alternative changes in order to bring about, if we aspire to, a better world order. Africa is a continent which really has a great, great potential in the domain of tourism. It is the home of a multitude of wildlife which have disappeared in many parts of the world. The African people also are noted for sports. We could go to Africa not only to watch great football match like South Africa very well organized last year, but maybe boxing championship, go to Kenya for the races. You know, Zimbabwe used to be a great cricket country. But then Mugabe said, well, cricket is too much identified with colonialism. So cricket was killed. But we know South Africa is famous rugby. Ghana, football, etc., etc. I do feel that we can establish peace and then African culture Add to this, we can turn Africa into a great tourist destination. And let us not overlook the fact that tourism after oil is the second largest factor in world trade. But we need peace. And we need a reduction of criminality which should exist in areas of poverty for different other reasons, we must fight this. Africa must be more open if you want tourists. There must be no requirement for visa. You should be able to go there, get a visa on arrival, allow you to stay two or three weeks, but then you've got to move. If you don't move, you may have to spend a few weeks in an African prison. Now, who wants to go and spend a few weeks in an African prison? Not me. So if you allow me to come there without a visa for three weeks, I'll make sure that when my three weeks expire, I'm at the airport. My friends, there are so many aspects of the angle. Maybe you have a few questions. So I should perhaps put a full stop to what I've got to say. But I love Africa and I know Africa's potential. And Africa also must realize that the days of colonials are gone. Africa is now in the ends of Africa. 
let's forget about the days. For example, I'm speaking about slavery. You know, it takes a European one year to work, to save, to be able to go to a place like Seychelles to spend two weeks holiday. And when he goes there, after so much hard work, after being a slave in his own country, he is not interested in the fact that some of our people were descendants of slaves. He wants value for money. If you don't give it to him, service with a smile, he will go to Thailand, he will go to the Philippines. Well, against the background of current development, I believe that many of us are in state of reflections as to the way ahead. And I wish Africa well, and I thank you all for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sir James. We'll take two questions. What we'd like to do at this particular time, we are pressed for time. So I'll have to bring in the courtesy ICD rule, which will be when you announce your name and where you're from, please formulate your question briefly within 60 seconds because we are pressed and our other guests are coming on in. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Suleiman Ibrahim Dabo from Nigeria, currently a PhD student from University of Leipzig. Um, I think I'm quite inspired by your lecture, first of all, because I think uh, quickly when you looked into the issue of arms and ammunition in Africa, I think this is a, a very, very interesting area where we tend to neglect or I don't know whether we are not conscious of that. Because I remember reading an article from the DFID magazine written by Oscar Arias. Uh, uh, yeah. I know most of us are familiar with him, and he was saying that in 2003, military expenditure on conventional weapons in the globe was $26 billion, and two-thirds of that money came from Africa. So the question here is, uh, these ammunitions are coming from the Western world, and if the Western world is really serious and honest with Africa, then therefore they should tell them that that is a misplaced priority. You have poverty, hunger, malnutrition everywhere. Why don't you? We are not going to solve these weapons. Because, for example, I'm from Nigeria now. If you look at the historical antecedents of so many societies in Nigeria, for example, the Niger Delta area, or the recent crisis in Jaws, we had a series of crises prior to this time. And the position, where if you look at the weapons these people are using, compared to what had happened before, you can, it's unimaginable. So I think there is the need. If this is not a question. I think it's just a, a kind of corroborating or reinforcing what you are saying. Thank you very much. We'll take a last question. And please, if you can help me out, and thanks for the contributor, but if you can help and lock it in 60 seconds, because we do have a lot coming on up. So I know you can do it, so just help me out. We'll take the gentleman over there. Did you have your hands raised up? No. Okay. Mainly, I, I, I really agree with you, but uh, there's this element that I wanted maybe to comprehensively uh, clarify. In terms of the, the Western powers not, not letting it go on Africa, uh, there's still persistent and, 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 and persistent interference in the internal affairs, either by through mechanization, creation of new uh, opposition, creation of new things. This is not an official position. I'm Malus Mahal from the Department of International Relations, working with the Minister of International Relations in South Africa. It's not an official position of government. I have factual facts that most of other African countries, this thing is, 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 is continuing to happen. Well, uh, first question. Let me say that I know of a situation in Africa where one government had accumulated 
quite a few billion dollars in reserve. And now half of this money was transferred to the U.S. as a result of one defense deal. And then they were receiving equipment for which the people there were not, if you want, uh, able to manage. They had to rely on third party from overseas. And the same leader who was made to buy this sophisticated equipment few years later, we're selling them for scrap metal value in the interest of a few dollar commission. Now, uh, you have also raised a very interesting point about certain developments in the world which are a bit frightening. Now, I'm particularly a bit worried about the creation by the USA of what it's called the US Africa Command. Now, the U.S. Africa Command is an organization based in Germany. And what's its objective is to train African into modern weaponry, to make African modern soldiers. But to me, it's implied that the Americans themselves do not want to go and fight on the soil of Africa. So they're going to train the Africans and they're going to train them with such modern weapons that I think uh, Africa will suffer. So this is a development which, as a matter of peace, I have questioned, but it is to the leaders of today in Africa to raise the matter at higher profile level so that we, and I do agree that this uh, ammunition defense budget business is priority number one in terms of allowing Africa to preserve some of its own resources. Thank you.